teach the Word of God is an honor, and we, we really do thank God for the honor that is bestowed upon us to teach the Word of God. We don't count it as something ordinary, and uh, we, we say thank you, Lord, for the privilege of speaking your words, and, uh, and uh, we pray that we'll have receptive hearts to the Word. Can you say amen? Uh, the, the Ten Commandments were not given you restrictively. Uh, I, I think you look at them long, wrong, and the devil certainly looks at them wrong, that the Ten Commandments are, are given to you in order to open up a beautiful life, you know, uh, in order for the rose to open to its complete beauty and its, and its maximum of fragrance. And so uh, the Ten Commandments is part of the fabric, is part of the fabric of the universe. And if you break the fabric of the universe, then you, you break down the reason for being here, and you, you break down the, the joy of living. And so in, in the Ten Commandments, they're not just to put you in a straitjacket. They're to open you up to a vast world of joy and pleasure. We have come now to uh, a really an exciting part of the study of the Ten Commandments in that we have gone to the Eleventh Commandment. Uh, that's kind of breaking out of bounds, isn't it? But it's very exciting to go to the Eleventh Commandment because the Eleventh Commandment is a summary of truth. And uh, when you sum it all down, this is what it means. And, and so the Eleventh Commandment is a summary of the Ten Commandments. And when we look at it in that way, then we go say, uh, come on, let, let's see what the Eleventh Commandment is. This commandment was given uh, possibly uh, approaching the end of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, His earthly ministry. And Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments by giving them two great commandments. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37, it, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. He was trying to show this person who had come asking for truth. He had trying to show him that there was a way to reach all the commandments with one point. And he said, this is that point, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then in Matthew uh, 22 and verse 39, two verses down, he said, the second is like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Many times it's, it's easy to, to love vertical, but it's so hard to love horizontal. And, uh, and what we need to do is, is to be sure that all of our love is not vertical, because if it ceases to be horizontal, the vertical runs out, you know? You, you, you can't keep the vertical going without the horizontal. You cannot truly love God if you don't love those around you. Now, that's not easy, you, you know, it's not easy. Most of us can love God pretty easy. But it's lo loving that next door stinky neighbor with that stinky dog that makes it so hard for us to, you know, well, there you go. Now, Jesus called this a new commandment. Uh, and uh, in John 13 and 34, he says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Isn't, isn't that beautiful? Can you tell your children that, that you live as I have lived? You watch me and do what I do. Now, most parents will say to their kids, now, don't you do like I'm doing. Well, that's just a waste of your breath, really. You sit and puff a cigarette, don't you smoke a cigarette, it might give you cancer. And they say, well, let's both have one together, you know, and have one for, for dessert. You, you, just, you just can't expect others to walk in the way that you talk and not in the way that you act. You just will have to make the two go together, and Jesus put them together. He says that you love one another just like I have loved you. Now, some of those fellows were just a little bit unlovable. I think you could figure that one out. And that you also love one another. Then he further said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law. This new commandment destroyed nothing. This new commandment was not an aberration that said, now listen, that old thing there, it don't work anymore. He said, no, sir, that is not true. I have not come that I might destroy anything. I have not come to destroy truth for sure. 
I, I have not come to destroy. He said, I, I have come that I might fulfill. And so uh, he, he says, uh, in, in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Think not I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. He, he, he brought in the prophets also. I am not come to destroy. I've come to fulfill. I'm to make it run over. I'm to give you the abundance. I'm to show you how it works and how it functions and, and show you the glory of it, you see, and, and not, and, and not the, uh, the, the binding of it. I'm, I'm so afraid that the devil tells people it's hard to live for Jesus that many people would like to live for Jesus, but they just think it's too hard. Now, I don't accept that at all. I believe it's easier to live for God than it is to live for the devil that there's more fun in living for God than it is the devil. When I see all these people with messed up lives and messed up homes, I said, <laughs> I'm just glad I'm not in that bunch. I'm glad I'm somewhere else where I am actually enjoying living and I'm actually in, enjoying being on planet Earth and, and uh, I'm not one of those that says, my, isn't, isn't, isn't hard to serve God. God is not a hard taskmaster. He does show you principles of truth and he says, now, if you get on a house and say to the law of gravity, I don't believe in you, and you jump, you're going to believe in the law of gravity in about three seconds, you see. Yeah, it, it'll, you'll become aware that you're breaking the structure of the universe and, and that you can't break the structure of the universe and that you're much happier when you don't try to break it. You, 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 you live with it, you know. You live with it. There are so many things in our lives that, that uh, we're permitted to see that we're not permitted to touch. Uh, a beautiful butterfly is just so beautiful if you keep your hands off of it. But these people that chase butterflies, they get a mess, you know. As soon as you put your hand on it, you've just got a glob of glob of nothing. And you said, I wish I'd have left it alone. It was so pretty as long as I was just looking at it. When we were in Tibet, we saw butterflies that must have been eight or ten inches across. I, I, mean, I mean, sparkling in glory. You'd say, Lord, why did you hide these beautiful creatures up here? Why didn't you put some in my town? Well, he didn't. He put them up there where you couldn't get your hands on them uh, so he could enjoy them. Now, a lot of the things of nature that God just enjoys. He, he took it away from you because you ever got there, you'd spoil it anyway. And there are many things in life that you can look at, but keep your hands off of it. Are you here? Yeah, I'm talking to you boys. Keep your hands off these girls. You just look at them. Keep your hands off of them. That's right, son. Now, if you're going to marry them and take on the responsibility, you better leave them alone. In Jesus' name. And think not that I have come to destroy the law. I am come to fulfill. He is the fullness. He is the blessing. He is, the, he is, what, we, he is what we must have. Then he says in 18, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until it all be flowing over, until it all be <laughs> fulfilled, until it all becomes maximum in beauty and glory. And so there it lays, the, the, the 11th commandment, which is love the Lord thy God and, and then love your neighbor. And those are the two. Now, in a little review of our last day with the Ten Commandments here, Although we're going to have one more. Can you stand one more? All right. N the next Sunday, we're going to study the Ten Commandments of Faith. The faith has Ten Commandments, too. And so we're going to add just one more to it, uh, the Ten Commandments of Faith. This, this is the Eleventh Commandment here, and it has to do with really what we are relative to God and relative to our neighbor. And then uh, the, the next will be relative to, to God and yourself, T Ten Commandments of Faith. We, we'll do that next Sunday, the Lord willing. Now, in, in the first... In the first five commandments that we studied, we found that their relationship was in that vertical situation. They went up toward God. When he said, now, we will not have polytheism on the face of this earth. You just won't worship this God and that God and the other God and the other God and the other God. He said, there is one God, one God. Say one God. And, and we must get that down inside of us that when it comes to worship, the worship is one. And, and it is never divided, it is never many, it is always and will always be one. And we must keep that, that vertical attitude within us that there is one God. And then the second one says, I will not permit idolatry in any form. No idolatry in any form will I, will I permit. And that, that means that you cannot make a 
thing to see with your eyes, to feel with your fingers, to hear with your ears. You just cannot make an image because he said, they that worship God must worship him in spirit. You know, God told the people of Israel, he, he said, your, your offerings are obnoxious to me because your spirit is not right. They could feel the offering, you know, and they could lay the offering there and they could see the offering. But inside of them, inside of them. You can put a display of religion on the outside of you and you can wear a cloak of religion around you that doesn't penetrate the inside. And if it does not penetrate the inside, God is not pleased with it. You can look ever so religious and ever so beautifully religious, but if there isn't a clean heart inside, God says that it is an abomination in his sight. He does not want it. So he doesn't want us making any little gods to, to, to bow down to or to worship. He says, keep yourself clean from idolatry. And the third one, he, he, he says, you must honor my name. The name of God is so precious. It's remarkable to me how the devil wants people to curse God. Why don't they start cursing the Joneses? And, and, and every time they cuss, just cuss the Joneses. We don't know who the Joneses are. But, but why do they want to curse God? Why would people blaspheme God? Why did they want to curse Jesus? Why did they want to curse God the Father? I can only give you one reason for it, and that is the devil hates God, and when the devil gets in you, he wants you to blaspheme God. We should watch our speech because the Bible says what your mouth says. Isn't that right? Yeah. What your mouth says comes out of the inner part of you. And your inner part of you can say, I am one thing, and your mouth begins to speak another thing. God says, oh, I, I take the inner part, not the outer part. And so he is judging you by what's on the insides of us. And he says, don't, don't speak silly of my name. Don't blaspheme my name. Don't curse my name. And blasphemy in its final stage is a spirit. I, I, a man from New York City traveled all the way to this place right here. And he told me that in New York, he had been put off the bus maybe a dozen times for blaspheming so loud until the people on the bus stopped up their ears and the driver came back and threw him off. And he said, I couldn't stop it. Cursing was coming out of his insides and he couldn't stop it, you see. You never want to let the devil get a control of you to where he controls your mouth to speak out of you. That is wrong. That is absolutely wrong. And if you resist the devil, he will go away. You don't have to submit to the devil. You can only submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the devil wants you to do something, you don't do it. Amen. Right here at, at, our, at our Bible college, we were having a seminar a few years ago. And my wife went to walk down in the basement where we were feeding the people uh, to the dining room. And there was a man sitting on the step, hitting his head against a concrete wall, cursing. And he was cursing himself for not eating. He had already paid for his food. His food was paid for. And he was sitting on the step. He couldn't get off the step and walk into the dining room. The devil wouldn't let him. And he was hitting his head against the wall, cursing himself because he couldn't get up off that step and go in that dining room. And yet when my wife passed by, it was the easiest thing in the world to take him by the elbow and said, come on here. He walked right on in and began to eat. And was sitting there blaspheming himself. And maybe you haven't heard about it. But uh, in Chicago, I, maybe they have them in other cities too. W once a year, they have a cursing contest, a blasphemy contest. I, I got the clippings on it. A blasphemy contest to see who can blaspheme the worst, and they win a prize for it. Now, the Bible says you shouldn't do that. That's what the Bible says. So you should not dishonor God's name in any form. God's name is holy. And we must always let holiness flow out of our spirit toward God when we think of him as a person and we think of his name. Can you say amen? The fourth one, God says, I want you to give some time to me. Now, that's only normal. God says, give some time to me. Give me some time in your life. It's so easy. I've heard people say right here this morning uh, that they have worked so hard this last week, that they have just worked so hard this last week, and they didn't look too happy about it. That, that, that's not really living, that's existing. That's existing. You say, but you work hard. Well, I don't know anything about it. I don't think I do. I think I'm kind of halfway lazy. Being born in New Orleans, Louisiana will give you one-fourth laziness just by getting there. They lay it on you the day you arrive. The sun shines so bright, you know, until you just don't want to do much. And, and so I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. But I'll tell you one thing, I'm refreshed all the time. 
I am refreshed all the time. I know how to go before God and get my refreshing, to get my physical strength and my, and my spiritual strength. When, 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 my, when my body says stop, brother, I stop, you see, and I, and I take care of that body because God wants me to, you see, and, and I don't, but if you're not careful, that thing can become a mental condition. I met a, we used to have a man to come to this church. He came for years before he passed away. And I must have talked to him at least a thousand times. And every time he says, I'm tired. He could come back for two weeks vacation. I'm so tired, I don't know what to do. And I finally told him one day, I said, you know what's wrong with you? I said, you are not tired in your arms. You're not tired in your legs. You're tired in the brain. I don't know where it helped him or not. A lot of my observations don't help people. Anyway, God wants a part of your life. And, and he wants you to take a time of rest and he wants you to take a time of thinking about him and he wants you to take a time to worship and that we owe it to God to, to take it. Now the devil won't give you any. In the heathen lands they don't have one day and seven off. Uh, they, 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 they sometimes have two or three days a year off. They don't know what it means to have one day and seven free. And so it's a gift from God and God wants us to have time just to reflex and say, hey now, how am I getting along in life? Life's going to soon be gone. How many have been to a cemetery lately? One, two, the rest of you are headed there too. You're headed there. Some of us are going to get there before others get there. We're on a race to who can get there. In fact, we got an appointment to get out there. Boy, you went silent. Whew. Yeah. You better as well rest and think about life and think there are people staying home right now that ought to be in church and you have no honest reason in the world for not being in the house of God right now. You see? You see? And, and, and you blame it on your body. I'm tired. Well, you won't be tired this afternoon playing golf. You won't be tired this afternoon playing tennis. You won't be uh, tired this afternoon gadding around talking to your neighbors, you see? And, and so you don't fool God at all. God is not fooled. All right. He says, I want some of your time. There should be a day of rest, and we should observe it. Number five. And this is interesting to me, that the first three are relative to God himself. The next one was to his day. And then in the, in the fifth one, he came to earth. And the first thing to honor on the earth was those who gave birth to you. To me, that is very significant. He didn't say be honest first. Uh, you know, he didn't say that. He said, honor your parents first. Now, I, I don't believe you've got the ability... Uh, to decide whether your parents should be honored or not. I don't think it's any of your business. You're to obey the Bible, and you're to honor your parents. And, and if you say they shouldn't be honored, you honor them anyway. And God, and God will bless you for honoring your parents. I honored my parents, and I helped my parents as long as they lived on the face of the earth. I felt it was my, my privilege to do that, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that I did it. And we want you to honor your parents. And it's so easy to speak spitefully and angrily at your parents and stomp your feet and run out as if you know something. Ten years later, you find out you didn't know anything. You should have kept your mouth shut. And it won't, it won't hurt you anyway to, to listen to somebody. And, 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 uh, and if you don't understand it today, think about it for a few years. You might come around to understand it. Like the young man who said when he was 19 years old, he, he couldn't imagine his father being such an idiot. But when he was 22 years old, he wondered how he got so smart in those three years. He didn't realize he had smarted up a little himself. Anyway, let's obey the laws of the Lord, and it's good for us to obey. It's good for us to obey. All right, on your page 53, the last five, that was the first five, the last five, and in, in, in summary and consummation of the commandments, and the last five, they are related uh, to man only. And the first one says that we should not, the sixth commandment says you should not take human life. You should not take human life. What, what a great, what a great, what a great commandment that is, that you should not take human life. Every person on the face of this earth, primitive or non-primitive, he knows within himself he should not take a human being's life. He knows it's all right to take the life of an animal and eat the flesh of that animal, but he knows it's wrong to take a human life. He knows that. He knows that. It's born in him. God put it in there. He knows it's a transgression to take a human life. Whether it's a little baby or, or an older person, it, he knows it's wrong to take human life. God put instinct within us for these Ten Commandments that we know they, what is wrong in our insides and that God wants us to follow them. In our Seventh Commandment, he said you should not uh, violate 
the marriage union. You should not commit adultery. And so uh, from honoring your, your father and your mother, and, and you should not kill. Then he says, now, if you're going to have a home, and, and if you're going to live right on the face of the earth, then you, shall, you will not be able to vi violate the marriage union. And if you do, then there's judgments of God that will be poured upon such a person. They have to reap the, they have to reap the awful fruit of, of living that kind of a life. And then in the Eighth Commandment, he says you should not violate the sanctity of property. The sanctity of property. That property is, 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 is spiritual. There are people that live on a piece of land because grandma lived there, great-grandpa lived there, and it becomes a very sensitive place to their living. And they don't want to give up that place for the simple reason it has a, a heritage there. And because of that heritage that they have planted there, they want to live in that spot. And so, and so God says that we should not steal. We should, we, we should not uh, take what belongs to another person. Their property could be very precious to them, and that we must never steal it or take it away. And then in your ninth commandment, he said, now you should not bear a false witness. You should not just go around lying. That lying is wrong, that you should not say something about a person that you don't know about. Almost, what, 75% of all the things we say about other people, we, it's hearsay, and very likely it's not even true. And if it's true, it's only half true. You should, have, you should have kept your mouth shut, you know. And, and so please be careful not to bear false witness because that's breaking one of the commandments of God. Then the last one, the tenth one, is, is a great one. For us not to be covetous. It's so easy to be covetous, to, to envy what other people have, to, to have a spirit of greed within us, to take more than our share of anything. And so that last one, aren't those, aren't those ten ways to live? Aren't they great, really? Every time I read them, I get excited about them, you know. I say, isn't that wonderful? Isn't God great to have given them to us? Isn't it wonderful that he wrote them himself with his own finger? And so they wouldn't erase, the rain wouldn't erase them. He put them in a piece of stone and wrote them there, permanently there. And, and for your information, they're up in heaven right now. And when you get there, you're going to see them. You're going to see them for sure. Uh, they'll be right there encased, and you'll be able to look at them. And, and God said, now, this is what you're supposed to live by. And if you live by them, you will, be, you will be blessed. Now, your point number three, the moral issue then, the moral issue related to these Ten Commandments is that when we feel the guilt, you know, and the condemnation for breaking those commandments, and we see and observe the holiness and the perfection of God, we don't know what to do with them. We don't know what to do about it. So the spiritual issue is this. When we try to keep the commandments, and we fail to keep them, and, and we're living in Romans chapter 7, condemned by the things that were happening in our own, own lives, and in Galatians chapter 3, and we're living under that condemnation, what can we do about it? What can humanity do about it? The judge in the Supreme Court can send you to jail for it, but God can do more than that. He can change your insides and you never want to do it anymore. All right, the natural man, once we realize our human inability to perform the Ten Commandments, our true sinful conditions become apparent to us. That, that there's something wrong on the inside of us. And, and seeing our need and our powerlessness to perform the good, we're driven then to a, a Lord and a Savior and a God, and His name is Jesus. That we might receive from God through faith the free gift of forgiveness and total acceptance. Write Romans 8 down and read it about three times today, and you'll be glad you did. It is, it is the victory. Don't bother chapter 7. You've lived there so long anyway. You've got a nest in there. Get over into chapter 8 and let God say there's therefore now no condemnation. He cleanses us up and he cleans us out. He gives us a new nature. If you're glad for it, say amen. Once we have accepted Christ and we're living in him, then these commandments become the source of knowledge of God's will, of God's will. Then, then these commandments become a source of understanding the will of God and the way the Christian expresses his new life in Christ. You ought to read that in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10, and see that the Ten Commandments then become something altogether different to us. They're not something I hear tugging at us, pulling at us, and pushing at us. They're alive. They are alive. Jesus magnified the Ten Commandments. He minimized the, the nothing by his teaching. Every broken commandment, of the Decalogue is a violation of 
love. It's a violation of love. If man is controlled by love, there is no breach. There is no breach. Romans 8, verse 8 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth within you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is alive because of of righteousness. If a man loves God, he'll have no other gods before him. It becomes very simple. If he loves God, he won't have graven images. If he loves God, he will not blasph blaspheme. If he loves God, he'll, he will rest on the Lord's day. If a man loves God, he will honor his parents. If he loves God, he will not kill somebody else. If he loves, if he loves God, he will not commit adultery. If he loves God, he will not steal. Are you here? See how easy it is? If a man loves God, he will not bear false witness. If a man loves God, he will not covet other men's property. Hallelujah! So there's, there's the basis of it. Love is righteousness. Love is stronger than duty, having to perform. Love forgets self. Therefore, at Mount Calvary, when Jesus died, uh, answers back to Mount Sinai, where this law came from. Mount Calvary says to Mount Sinai, I've got you covered with love. <laughs> and it's a new world. It's a new world. It's not a hard world. At Mount Sinai, an animal's blood was shed for sins, but at Calvary, God shed his blood in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. So love fulfills the total law. Man must love his neighbor. 